So let's stand together and let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Sunday morning studying the book of Philippians together and as we make our way there just a reminder if you don't have a Bible just flag one of these guys coming up the aisles right now. Always good to hear the word but even better to hear it and see it and then make that Bible yours today if you don't own one. Uh, Sunday nights we go through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, and we'll be heading into uh, John's Gospel, chapter 18 this evening, and then as was mentioned, we'll enjoy the Lord's Supper as a part of our service tonight uh, as well. Each of you are invited. We pick things up in chapter 4, verse 1. Paul writes by the Holy Spirit, Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. I implore you, Odia, and implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers who na whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. Let's pray together. Father, we pray for a work of your Holy Spirit this morning in our lives. We're thankful that we never turn to your book or need not without the fullness of your Spirit who has authored this and uh, to then uh, open our eyes up to the fullness of the revelation that is found here. And we pray that you would uh, instruct us in righteousness this morning. We pray that you would thoroughly furnish us unto every good work that we might continue as we study your word to grow into and experience and explore the fullness of the life that Jesus has provided to us. We pray for this work of your spirit in his name, in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Here as we come into chapter four of the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul begins what is uh, not too lengthy of a descent to the conclusion of kind of his journey here, if we like it to the landing of an, an airplane uh, as, he, as he brings it uh, to its end here at the end of chapter uh, four. We talk about uh, here this concluding section of the book of Philippians and that he is winding things up. It doesn't mean that what he's speaking about here now uh, in, in this chapter is in any way uh, incidental or secondary at all. Anybody who has ever written anything uh, of any consequence realizes that um, you need to end that with, uh, with clarity and uh, the kind of clarity that will allow people to understand what the whole uh, letter or the whole essay or the whole um, uh, book was all about and so to bring it to a clear uh, and, and coherent conclusion and that's exactly what he does. In these five verses and in the chapter as a whole, uh, he re-emphasizes certain points that he's already made uh, in the letter but he also introduces some new uh, 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 points that he hasn't addressed previously. Once again, uh, in verse 1, Paul makes his affection uh, to this congregation of these Christians unmistakably known. He's done it throughout the letter, most remarkably at the beginning of the letter and then uh, here. And when you read about the terms that he uses in, in verse 1, he's going to say some uh, very hard things to them. Uh, and what we're looking at today and then even a little bit further in, into this chapter. And he wants them to be reassured of his love, that in saying these things, it comes out of a motivation of love in his life toward them. He doesn't want them to feel that in saying these things that uh, the, the love that he has for them or the relationship that they have with him is in uh, jeopardy in any way, but the things need to be said uh, but he wants to uh, reassure them in, in that way. He fairly falls all over himself and trying to put his love for them in words. He even repeats the word beloved uh, in the same sentence. It's almost as if 
uh, he feels that as he's trying to express his love in human language, it is uh, failing him. And so he refers to them as my beloved, my long for uh, brethren, speaking of his desire to see them once again, my joy, the very thought of them brought joy to him. Uh, he cons calls them his crown, his overjoy with the fact that they were the fruit of his ministry, that he had had the privilege of introducing them uh, to Christ, the privilege of uh, knowing them and investing his life in their uh, life. And as he uh, speaks to them in these overflowing kind of terms, uh, in, at the end of verse one, Paul calls them to stand fast in the Lord. That is to be immovable as Christians in what it is that he has declared in chapter three. That's why the therefore is uh, there. Immovable in the face of the false teaching uh, that was coming uh, against the church and the false teachers who were endeavoring to tempt them or us uh, into compromise concerning the word of God and concerning uh, the Christian life, whether that be uh, legalism, those who uh, want to make the word of God and the commandments of God more demanding than they actually are, or uh, theological liberalism, where uh, people come in and they try to explain away the demands of Scripture upon our lives uh, as Christians, and always in order to accommodate sin or to uh, uh, accommodate uh, a life of sin. But whatever the form uh, it might take of, as he referred to them as the enemies of the cross of Christ in verse uh, 18 of chapter three, uh, whatever form that group of people might take, he says, stand fast against it and to stand fast in the Lord. Immovable in our confidence, as well uh, of heaven one day and our commitment to live uh, supremely with our heavenly citizenship in mind, uh, as important as our earthly citizenship uh, can be. In this vein of standing fast, I, um, I, whenever I, as a part of my quiet time in the morning, I always read two devotionals and usually they're very, very uh, different from one another. I'm currently reading one by John Stott and then uh, one by uh, Elizabeth Elliot. And uh, Elizabeth Elliot and her devotional, Lamp Unto My Feet, uh, reading it this last week, she uh, writes this in terms of uh, standing fast, or at least it certainly has that application. She said in China in the early 1930s, a missionary couple, John and Betty Stam, were captured by Chinese communists and marched through the streets of the village to a chopping block where each was beheaded. Uh, if they had been willing to recant their Christian faith, their lives would have been spared. And given their commitment to Christ, such a choice was unthinkable. They placed not only their lives, but also the life of their baby, Helen Priscilla, in the hands of God, confident that God would protect them if he chose, and if he chose not to, it was safer to be in those hands than anywhere else in the universe. Like thousands of Christians before them, they preferred the sword to disobedience, believing that the danger of not knowing God is infinitely greater uh, than any other danger. Most of us are, as Christians, certainly in the United States, are not going to uh, face the threat of the sword or death for uh, our Christian faith. But it doesn't mean that we should not stand fast for the things of the Lord and to stand fast as Christians for certain things and against certain things that, uh, that, would, uh, that would attack it any less than if that were the threat within, uh, within our lives. And so that steadfast commitment, uh, whether it uh, standing fast, whether it uh, is going to be tested in a moment in time as happened with the stams, uh, or whether it is tested on a daily basis over and over and uh, requiring us to uh, die to our selfishness and die uh, 
to our uh, self-will and to our flesh in order uh, to do that. But whatever it requires, it's important to stand fast. Uh, the things of the Lord, our relationship with the Lord being more important than anything else in life and life itself. In verses two and three, he addresses then a conflict between Euodia and Syntyche. And uh, those are female names in the ancient world, so we know it in involves two women. Throughout the letter, the Apostle Paul has been kind of hinting all along uh, at some kind of a dangerous threat that was uh, to the unity and the joy of the church in the form of some kind of a carnal uh, dispute or conflict that was going on within the church. It was born out of uh, carnality. It was born out of selfish ambition, born out of pride as he addressed those issues in chapter two. And now he reveals the central cause of this disunity to be a private conflict uh, between two women in the church named Euodia and Syntyche. And their private dispute has somehow spread into the church and it's become a central focus of the church as a result. And it has the danger at this particular point of threatening uh, the health of the church, uh, the spiritual focus of the church, and the danger of splitting the church into two groups. The fact that their uh, dispute was not doctrinal or that their dispute uh, was not related to some great sin in one person's life that had been committed against the other is clear by the fact that if it were a doctrinal issue or an issue of clear sin on the part of one to the other, the Apostle Paul would have addressed those things directly uh, in, in the letter. Uh, if it were a doctrinal issue that was dividing them, he would have made it a teachable moment. He would have cleared up any false doctrine at all in the light of God's word. If it were an issue of sin that one had committed against the other, he would have just simply called on the one to repent, to ask for forgiveness, and then called on the offended party uh, to then uh, extend forgiveness uh, to uh, that sinning uh, person. This dispute between these two women, as is the case with most disputes involving interpersonal relationships, uh, wasn't as clean cut as those two things. Paul doesn't actually make known to us the actual issue behind the dispute, the actual cause of it uh, here. I personally think that that's uh, entirely by design, by the Holy Spirit and by the Apostle Paul, so that we wouldn't make that the focus of our attention as opposed to just receiving the instruction that Paul gives us here generally to deal with all personal conflicts that occur in our lives and certainly as they occur uh, within the body of Christ or to narrow Paul's instruction down to a single issue that, would, uh, uh, that we would uh, uh, try and apply it to and say, strictly Paul was dealing with this, but not with other things. And so he leaves it uh, broad. I don't think that we do any harm to the passage by considering the kinds of things that often become the cause of uh, personal conflicts in our lives as Christians. Uh, I heard many, many years ago, and uh, very cleverly, I think, somebody has renamed these women, um, you odious and soon touchy. And uh, which shines a little uh, light on certainly two of the causes that uh, create conflict between Christians in the body of Christ and in a local church. First, there's Euodius, the Christian whose life is marked by some smelly uh, part of their flesh or their old nature, and they refuse to address it in their own life. They come to believe that uh, the fact that this offends other people is not their problem uh, at all, but it's the problem of other people. I am what I am, and I'm not changing, and that's your problem. And so uh, these are very, very unpleasant people. 
uh, who will typically die alone, but they do a lot of damage in the meantime. And then you have uh, Soon Touchy, the Christian who is very, very thin-skinned and easily offended at every kind of misguided uh, uh, word or action of others. They not only notice it, but they take it very, very personally. And uh, uh, they find a personal slight in everything that isn't said perfectly to them and everything that isn't qualified in such a way that they don't take it personally. And so this whole idea of snowflakeism is as old as human history. Uh, and here, uh, this kind of person exists. It's not a new uh, phenomenon. They've always existed. They feel personally slighted if someone doesn't uh, greet them at church with all of uh, the enthusiasm that they feel that they need or all of the enthusiasm with which they feel that they deserve. And if I have these kind of tendencies in my life, there's non nothing wrong with recognizing the, uh, uh, for myself as a Christian that I am uh, too thin-skinned and, and that it skews my understanding of reality, my perception uh, of reality, and I've got to learn to be careful not to interpret everything in a self-centered way and to recognize it's not a, 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 this hypersensitivity is not a spiritual gift from, from God, but that it is, uh, a, a, and not a virtue at all, but a danger to ever having meaningful relationships in my life. And to then ask God for the help to change and he will help us. One of the causes, other causes of conflict to be alert to are what Paul's already addressed within the letter earlier in chapter two, verse three. Pride certainly uh, brings this kind of conflict into any relationship. Selfishness does the same thing. Selfish ambition where people use other people to uh, frog leap to some position that they, they want. They use people, they use relationships in order to uh, advance themselves. Other things can be inflexibility, and as a result, uh, a, a relationship has to be entirely on uh, my terms. It can be a lack of grace, where one or both parties uh, demand perfection of the other person, and the relationship now becomes one that's based upon works uh, rather than upon grace. There can be personality conflicts, and again, just carnality and spiritual immaturity. And those things are most dangerous when we don't recognize that it is a, uh, a spiritual maturity on my part that is behind uh, the conflict. And there are many other things as well, but that primes the pump uh, just a little bit. Now, disagreements and conflicts are not uh, unusual in personal uh, relationships. Uh, everyone's going to have difficulty and conflicts in personal relationships, even in the best of, of relationships. That is not what is uh, the issue here uh, that Paul is addressing. The problem here is that Euodia and Syntyche were no longer working to resolve it. So now it becomes a problem for the local church. It becomes a distraction and a focus within the church and uh, it is bringing division as well. The body of Christ is a highly relational and a very interconnected uh, organism. That's why the Apostle Paul uses a body to describe the relationship that we have with one another uh, as, uh, as Christians. And because it's highly relational, and interconnected, and it is that by design, relationships are always going to be a special target uh, of Satan uh, in, uh, in coming against his attempt to uh, come against a church or an attempt to strain or to destroy relationships within a church through uh, conflict. First in attempting to distract a church as a result of that strain from uh, the Great Commission uh, 
uh, these kind of things end up turning a body inward in its focus, and it loses an outward focus as a result uh, of that. And if he's really successful, uh, then he can uh, destroy the church by this means. And so, uh, because a local church is so relationally connected, he will often create a conflict between two people in the church. And our immediate temptation as members of that church is then to take a side, uh, not based upon Scripture, uh, not based upon biblical principle, not based upon uh, Christ-likeness, but based upon our personal relationship with the two people that are involved in the conflict, especially when uh, one of the other persons uh, in the conflict puts a unspoken pressure upon us to choose their side uh, by virtue of having a friendship or relationship uh, with them. And uh, so they demand our loyalty to them uh, as a badge of loyalty. But once we choose to deal with it in that way, openly identifying with the one and uh, defaming and shunning the other, we will cease to be effective in helping resolve the conflict and will have played into uh, the devil's hands related to the conflict. He will have already been successful in dividing the two, and now he moves into a broader aim, if he's able to, of now uh, dividing a larger segment of the church. Of course, it is our natural reaction to come alongside and to defend our friends. But sometimes, and it's important to understand this, Sometimes our friends can be wrong. And when that happens, we have to be able to have the maturity to put the health of the local church above that relationship. Even if it puts a strain on the relationship uh, for a time where God gets through to all of our, uh, our hearts and, uh, and the importance of that. It's very vital, I think, to notice that Paul's counsel to them in verse 2 was to be of the same mind. Paul would not have offered this as a solution to them, except he knew that behind all of the words and all of the excuses and all of the justifications, that at the core of this conflict between them was a failure on the part of both of them to be of the same mind in the Lord. And so whatever the, the cause or, or the, perhaps the long history of the conflict, they were each equally guilty of failing here in this, in, on this point. And that's why he declares equally, and he repeats himself here, I implore Euodia, I implore uh, Syntyche. And in doing so, he called on each of them to do the right thing regardless of, of what the other did, to take on the same mind of the Lord in the situation. Very often in all kinds of conflicts in our lives, especially um, in marriages, sometimes the problems go unresolved because each person is waiting for the other person to do the right thing. Uh, marriage is a fairly simple thing at its core in terms of the scriptures. God uh, doesn't uh, burden the husband and the wife with uh, 60 different commandments. He gives uh, the husband a single commandment supremely that he is to love his wife as, life, uh, uh, as uh, the, Jesus loves the church. The wife is told that she is to submit to her husband as unto uh, the, the Lord. But each of them so often then waits for the other to make the first move, rather than just saying, all right, I know what God has called me to do. I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do that out of my own relationship with God. I'm going to give him my obedience to work with in this situation. But typically, each one will say, I will make a move 
when they make a, a, a move. And it's always an indication that Jesus is not the supreme influence in the marriage or individually in their lives. That relationship with Christ doesn't mean more to them uh, than the relationship that they have uh, with their spouse. And so nothing ever gets resolved and usually the problems just get worse. Paul has defined the mind of, of the Lord earlier in chapter uh, two. If you turn a couple pages back, uh, let's, uh, I'll read it if you follow along in verse one. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind esteem others better than them himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but for the interests of others, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So he's already laid the foundation for what this exhortation he was going to make of them and, uh, and uh, uh, so that it would be clear to them and us what he was referring to. It's important to notice too that Paul did not call them to come to have the same view on whatever subject it was that was dividing them in this conflict. conflict. The solution here was not to come to the same view regarding what it was that they were in conflict over, but in viewing it and in handling it in a way that looked like uh, Jesus. That is without selfishness, without uh, ambition, without pride, but with humility and lowliness of mind, esteeming the other person better than ourselves and concern not only for our own interests, but their interests as well. The real problem here and the reason that this thing had uh, blown up as it had there in the church was their lack of Christ-likeness, their failure to make him their example in addressing and resolving the conflict. And so Paul calls on them here now in the letter to do that. It's an old saying, better late than never. And uh, it's a little late for them, but it's not too late for them. And so he steps in and, and says, he calls on them to do that. To just say to the Lord, Lord, Help me to follow uh, you and your will, to follow your example here in this situation, and I will do it as unto you. I give you my obedience in this situation uh, to work with, and I give it to you uh, no matter what the other person does or, or doesn't do. Now, that's not necessarily going to mean that the relationship is going to be made as good as, as new. Hopefully it will, but at the very least, it eliminates the conflict. The conflict ceases, because it always takes two to fight, and so it would bring an end to the conflict. It's also important to notice that Euodia and Syntyche were not marginal Christians, verse 3. Uh, but they uh, had been faithful in service to God, uh, probably very instrumental working alongside Paul in the establishment of the church there in Philippi. They are service uh, tested, ministry tested, experienced uh, Christians. These women, Paul says, who labored with me uh, in the gospel. So what that tells me and what it tells us is that uh, we will never reach a point of, of maturity where we will not be vulnerable to this kind of thing if we're not careful. Uh, these were not brand new Christians. These people had been around the block a few times. They knew a few things. They'd walk with the Lord for a long time uh, by this point, uh, and yet uh, uh, even with that, we can be prone to this kind of conflict. Here Paul 
I think in speaking to them in this way, these women who labored with me in the gospel, I think he's also affirming their value to him, his, their value to, uh, to the church despite their current uh, dispute. So now imagine you are in the city of Philippi and uh, Paul's letter from Rome has come to the church, the hands of a, 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 a Epaphras. And, he, and he, as he, he comes here now with a letter, Epaphroditus, and, and the word goes out, it's going to be read as a part of the Sunday night uh, service. All of the excitement, all of the anticipation, and as it begins to be read, the hanging on uh, to every single word, and then suddenly, Euodia and Syntyche hear their names with Paul calling on them to bring their conflict to an end by acting more like Jesus. It would be like they had been hit with a lightning bolt um, in, that, uh, in that room. And all of the arguments that they had used against one another for justifying the conflict, the continuance of the conflict, all of the sense of self-importance that revealed in their refusal to resolve the conflict, even when it now threatened the spiritual effectiveness uh, of the church, were exposed as carnal and self-centered. And unwilling to listen to the Holy Spirit up to this point, and I have no doubt that the Holy Spirit had been speaking to them for a long time to resolve this thing under, in a much quieter way. Uh, the Holy, we, there is, I've never known the Lord to publicly uh, humble me, and he's done it, or to publicly humble another person, except that he warned for a long time uh, to take this seriously it wasn't taken seriously. I didn't listen to him privately, and so now he's got to deal with it, uh, deal with it uh, publicly. And so here, unwilling to humble themselves and uh, privately, God is forced to humble them publicly. Jesus taught concerning this, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Those aren't just words in the Bible that we put on plaques and put them up on our, our wall or that kind of thing. They're a promise. It's a promise from God. And he loves us enough uh, to do that, that if uh, we exalt ourselves, uh, then he will be faithful to humble us. Now, clearly, Paul knew both women, uh, and he, he knew they had the maturity uh, to handle this, this exhortation. But this statement of Paul didn't just hit Euodia and Syntyche like a ton of bricks. It didn't just speak to them. It would have humbled every single person in that church who had taken sides in the conflict and divided from others as a result and then played their part in jeopardizing the health and the existence of the church. On, now only to learn that they had not acted spiritually in doing so. They hadn't operated on the basis of some spiritual principle, but they'd done so on the basis of their flesh as well. And this statement of Paul would have rebuked everyone that was involved in it and then brought an end to all justifications for it and all uh, excuses for the continuance of it within the church, not only within the two women, but within the church as a whole. And so we examine our lives this morning in this regard. It doesn't mean in any relationship in our life in terms of conflict. There's going to be conflict. That's just the way that rela human relationships are this side uh, of of heaven, but uh, it doesn't mean that any one person in a relationship uh, can bring a conflict. Well, you can bring a conflict to an end. No one person has all of the power or the authority to resolve the issue because there's two people 
that are involved in, uh, in, in the issue. And that's why Paul wrote to the church in Rome, and I thought, and I think very obviously very wisely and uh, uh, realistically. He said, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all uh, men. But it, it doesn't mean uh, that uh, we resolve to take on the mind of Christ in that kind of situation and, uh, and, and give God our obedience in it. It does mean that. Then trust him to, to work both ends of it and, and bring a reconciliation here. But there's the recognition that I can do my side in it, but I may not, it, it may not end up uh, 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 resolving immediately because the other person is the other person with their own relationship with the Lord. And sometimes it takes a long time for the Lord to get through uh, to us. Notice too that the Apostle Paul called on someone in a position of spiritual authority there within the church to help Euodia and Syntyche in resolving the conflict there in, in verse three. He identifies this person as uh, a true companion. Uh, he knew who the person was. The church clearly knew who he was, was referring to here uh, to uh, enter into the situation and, and now begin to help these women who were clearly not uh, successful in, in bringing the conflict to an end on their uh, own. And so there's speculation on who this might be, that maybe it was Epaphroditus, or maybe it was Timothy, or maybe it was Luke. We don't really need to know, obviously. Nobody knows for sure. Uh, and we don't need to know in order to embrace the principle that we, uh, there are interpersonal conflicts that can arise in our lives with fellow Christians in which we need a deeply spiritual, humble, uh, good listening, uh, mature, gentle, impartial person uh, to help us see the conflict clear clearly and to help us resolve that conflict. And there's no shame in that. And in fact, Paul encourages it uh, here. Now, none of us is interested in the leadership of any church taking on the role of the Holy Spirit and interjecting themselves into every kind of conflict that's going on in our life that is going to resolve uh, independent of that leadership if they would just stay out of it and allow the Holy Spirit uh, to work. But it does tell us uh, that something can rise to the level where leadership would need to step in. And, and it's clear the Apostle Paul is a little bit troubled that nobody had stepped in at this point related to this uh, conflict. You notice that Paul speaks of Euodia and Syntyche as well as others. Uh, he references uh, their inclusion in the book of life. And the book of life is the, the book that contains the name of every uh, single Christian. Everyone is trusted in Christ for salvation. And uh, it's called the book of life because we possess uh, abundant life and we possess eternal life as a result uh, uh, of that. And so, uh, again, affirming uh, a, a nice way as Paul's very delicate on these issues, affirming uh, the love of God, affirming the, the spiritual uh, beauty and blessings of, of, of everyone involved, God's concern for every person that it's involved. And then maybe also communicating something along the lines of, listen, we're all going to be in heaven one day forever. And we're all going to get along uh, when we get to heaven. And we're going to get along when we get to heaven because we're all going to have the mind of Christ. And, uh, and so uh, we might as well start doing that here and uh, that is something that is often said uh, in terms of Christians to one another, and it's true. He closes at least our section we're looking at here this morning in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, I will say rejoice. It's interesting that he uh, interjects such a strong call uh, to joy. It's been a major theme through the entire passage, but now he comes back and he declares it with even greater strength at this point uh, in the letter. And I think he does that because almost nothing so kills joy 
uh, in our personal lives or in a local church as personal conflict. And so having addressed this now, Paul reintroduces the theme uh, of, the, uh, of joy here uh, in the letter. And maybe to make them realize uh, in Euodius and Tyche, others as well, how this conflict had adversely affected uh, the presence and the experience of joy uh, within their uh, lives. And so uh, to rejoice in the Lord, we always have a cause for joy within our lives uh, in all that we are and all that we have in Christ, in Jesus. But these things, uh, especially this perhaps like nothing else, uh, takes our eyes off of those causes for joy. In verse five, he says, let your gentleness be known to all men, the Lord is at hand. And so gentleness here speaks of, of being gentle, of being gracious, of being patient in our treatment uh, of people. Uh, Aristotle uh, contrasted this Greek word that Paul uses here for gentleness with another Greek word which means uh, strict justice. And so it speaks of the person who doesn't require perfection in another person uh, in order to have a relationship uh, with them. They're able to overlook the imperfections of, uh, in others. That's a gentle person, one who isn't always uh, demanding or uh, their due in the relationship or noticing in a hypersensitive way when they don't get their, uh, get their due. They're willing to yield for the sake of the relationship when that is the best course of action. It's to be really generous in spirit who even when people sin against this kind of person, this gentleness Paul commends to us uh, to such a degree that it requires on the part of the other person an apology and a request for forgiveness that this gentleness is one in which the person will then accept the apology um, where it will be sufficient for them to have a reconciliation of the relationship. They don't demand on top of it uh, their pound of, uh, of flesh. And so uh, when in doubt, as the old saying goes, uh, go with extending grace to others. We will rarely uh, regret it. Uh, but if we deal with people on the basis of law, uh, we will regret that uh, much more often, and uh, if not uh, universally. Most significantly, this uh, gentleness is described as a characteristic of Jesus. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse one. Now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. So you stop and we think about how gentle, how generous, how gracious, how patient uh, was Jesus with the apostles. Very. And why did he need to be that way? He's dealing with imperfection and he valued the relationship. And how generous and gracious and patient and gentle has Jesus been in his treatment of every single one of us as Christians? He's been very, very much so. And so gentleness in our treatment of one another, it's not a highly um, regarded character trait within our culture. Uh, not just on social media, but in entertainment and all kinds of things. People do not deal with people in terms of gentleness by and large. In fact, oftentimes it's viewed as a uh, a, a character weakness uh, in, in people. And uh, that certainly speaks, I think, in large part to the absence of joy in the world around us. But it is to be highly esteemed by us, and it is one of the absolute keys to consistently experiencing a life of joy. Without gentleness, uh, it, it, every relationship in our life will become a continual, test of reciprocal fairness or it will become a frustration. 
When Paul closes this by declaring the Lord is near, it could be a reminder uh, to them and to us that the Lord is always present with us uh, in, in our lives and in the situations of our life. And, and so it's important that he see that we're treating one another with gentleness for the sake of the unity of the body of Christ. It could be a reminder that he is, the Lord is at hand, that he is returning uh, related to the rapture. That's what it could be speaking about. Rapture of the church is always near. And then who would want to be caught in the middle of a conflict like this with another Christian at the time of the rapture? But in either way, it speaks to us in this regard. And so this morning, the apostle uh, begins his conclusion to the letter with calls to uh, steadfastness, uh, with a call to personal conflict resolution, and to gentleness. And in the context of joy, all three of those things play a vital part in the quality of Christian life that we enjoy, and certainly a vital part to, in the extent to which joy uh, marks our Christian life. Let's stand together now and we'll close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the clarity of this passage. And there's certainly great ease in our lives with being able to look at it and to see how it applies to our lives. We see all the temptations of Euodians and Tyche. There's nothing that's a mystery to us about either of them. And so, Lord, we thank you that you addressed not only them and not only them by name, but that you did so in order that we might be instructed concerning the same issues in our life. We pray that you would help us to live a life of gentleness as well, the joy that comes from that. And then, Lord, that steadfastness, the standing fast in the things of you in this life, knowing that this life is a vapor, whatever the cost may be to us, and the heroic that that produces within us, the joy of being able to live for you to have something that is not only worth uh, living for, but also worth dying for if necessary. Thank you for that meaning and purpose that you have brought into our lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.